It's the only wrestling podcast on earth with two former Major League Baseball All-Stars. We have one four-time Stanley Cup champion. We have the lead – well, not lead singer, but a singer from the band Rancid, Lawrence <laughs> Fredrickson. We have Petey Williams, the Canadian Destroyer. How's she going, eh? There we go. And, guys, we have a very special guest, a guy that I've been a fan of for a very long time. And when this interview fell into my lap, and I'll be honest, it was pretty cool because very rarely do we get a lot of Twitter followers that go, hey, we need you guys to have this guy on. But we started getting a lot of tweets like, we need you to get this guy on. We need you to get this guy on. And, you know, you just kind of tag him in a tweet like, let's see what happens. And here he is now, <laughs> the butcher himself. Hi, guys. Hi. I have a really weak voice. Everybody always gets a... Uh... Like the first thing people comment on is that I don't have a very strong voice. So sorry to ruin that for you guys. Not you guys, but uh, the <laughs> listeners, the watchers. Wait, did somebody just say something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't have a really gruff voice. I think that's why I don't talk. So, yeah, you hey, don't. I mean, you, no. look like you have the deepest voice now in the world. Like, I mean, just uh, maybe it's the mustache. Yeah. That's what it is. What? Yeah, I, I, I mean, it, you may not have a deep voice, but I mean, you look like you have a deep voice. Um, yeah, that's all that matters. So, as long as I pretend I do, that's good. Yeah. Um, so, hey, Dennis, if it's okay, uh, I want to ask the first question, switch it up a little bit. Right. Um, so, Butcher, we, uh, you know, uh, we met before, uh, you know, yeah. thanks for reminding me earlier. Yeah. Um, back in that smash wrestling for Seb uh, from the Toronto area. Um, but my question for you, so, that wasn't too long ago. That was like probably, you know, 2000, I don't know, 17, 18, maybe 19 yeah. or something like that. Um, so I'll ask the lame question first, but I, I really want to know. Uh, it's kind of a two-parter. So how, like, did this whole AEW thing get started? And, you know, your partner, Blade, uh, yeah. like, were you guys friends uh, beforehand? And you guys decided, hey, I'm going to, you know, we're going to take this tag team on the road kind of deal, pitch that. How'd that all come to fruition? Oh, um, it, it literally was just kind of like right place at the right time. So I was like working in smash and um, they were just, they kept putting me in like, uh, I mean, I was working for a, a bunch of different indies, but like smash, I was at regularly because it's, it's only 70 miles from, from uh, Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And he was in a tag team there called the well, well -oiled machines that were great. I love those guys, man. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and it just got to the point. I think like, I think, uh, Jess had just like left impact at that time. Mm -hmm. And, um, it just kind of seemed like he was only doing smash and he, you know, we had been talking about doing something and then it was just one day he was just like, all right, screw it. Let's do the tag team. Like, let's just, let's just do it. And, um, his, his partner, Mike couldn't get into the States. So it like, it was on my end, it was, it was perfect timing, but Mike, you know, got stuck in canada so yeah so you were kind of like his american tag team partner and he had a canadian tag team partner and he kind of cheated on you both yeah for a second for a second but mike was like the thing is though is like mike is so good that's psycho mike out of out of uh out of um rollins out of uh toronto he's amazing but he just he can't get in the states because of canada being weird mm -hmm. um and like i said it was just like me and Jesse were such fans of like '90s like action movies, so we just wanted to be like the weird guys that like the top heel would hire to like beat the bad guy up, and then we would always get beat up. You know what I mean? And that was it—just weird characters. I, I watched your interview with Miro, and it's been making the rounds lately. And it was one of those things that I, I, I wanted to do prep, and. Yeah the the basis of your characters is you just a bunch of weird guys without a backstory and i think somewhere in this podcast we should sit down and create a backstory for you guys i, I kind of have one uh i actually want to write a comic book about it so um yeah anyone that's watching this if you do comic book stuff uh i have a story for you <laughs> Well, that goes into your look because you have this amazing classic look about you. And Lars and I, we keep going back and forth. When we knew you were coming on, that was one of the top things Lars and I kept going back to was this amazing look. And Lars, I'll throw it to you. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, 
th there's so many questions I have for you, but this one <laughs> will sort of settle. Uh, I don't know if it'll sell something, but I, I kind of see you as like a bad news brown meets yeah. Jack Mulligan. Yeah. You know? <laughs> It's kind of like, it's your body, your style, your attitude, your yeah. fucking, your merch is next level. Um, you know, it, it looks like, like, a, like a fucking Cannibal Corpse t-shirt, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's I, so I feel like there's this, this thing about you, aesthetic about you. And I, and I wanted to know, was this something that was like, that you, that you consciously connected to, or is it something that you kind of just fell into, or was this something that's just seems to like, just naturally happen i guess is i'm my i have like anyone that if you have any AEW wrestler on in the future i have the widest imagination there is and anyone could vouch for it so like for me i i i thought that okay if i knew i was teaming with with jesse uh pepper parks uh braxton sutter the blade or whatever like that i knew that we were going to get noticed because he'd been around for a while and i just wanted to go over the top creative i knew we were going to get offers to wrestle for indies and i knew that if we had a look that no one else had at the time that it was going to get over because at the time in the indies there was like creative stuff happening but no one was really taking the reins on like the road warriors, like the weird, crazy looking dudes. So I was like, well, I can't really do the baby face thing because I'm covered in tattoos and I can grow a mustache in like four hours. <laughs> so like, I was just like, I, I originally wanted to do like a quit type character from Jaws. And that's, but like, Quint's a badass, but like, the problem is, is that like, I had only been wrestling for like three years, four years or something like that. You know what I mean? So like, I really couldn't have, I didn't have matches with like Samoa Joe or, you know what I mean? Like I had no history. So like, I couldn't go the like quint route because it's all bullshit. You know what I mean? Like I could say stuff about playing guitar in the band or something like that, but like that really doesn't translate in wrestling. And like Jesse taught me like the most valuable thing. He was like, do you want to get, treated like a pro wrestler or look like a pro wrestler and i was like all right motherfucker if that's the case then i'm gonna challenge you i'm gonna look like the fucking only pro wrestler do you know what i mean where like it's classic it's it's the vibe is weird and even when i changed my gear up like i tried to throw subtle nods to like other hoss dudes in the past like hashimoto like wore the sash so like i'm a huge hashimoto fan so like shini hashimoto was there obviously like abdul the butcher all the characters. And then with Jesse, he's so slick. Like his wrestling is so slick. And I was like, let's do a blade because he's super slick. Like I'm a dude that just chops the shit out of people. And he's the guy that will like cut them down. And it was just really weird. Like I said, random dudes. Like remember the dude in Roadhouse that had like the feather earring and like the toe blade? Yeah. Like, there's no backstory on that guy. Like, why the fuck did he have, like, a, a knife in his boot? And why did he have, like, like, none of the other guys had a feather earring. And it was never explained. It was just like, oh, this guy's obviously a badass. And Patrick Swayze is going to fight him next to a pond and rip his throat out. What? Like, he was destined to lose the whole time. And, like, I always liked those characters. They were always amazing in movies. And I always wanted to know more. It was like Boba Fett, like, in Star Wars. Like, you had this badass bounty hunter and then he just got ate by a sandworm. <laughs> like we really got blue balled on that one. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, hey, on. you said something super interesting a second ago about only being in the in industry four years at that point. How long have you been wrestling? Because this, this ties into another question I have. So I wrestled, I'm, I'm 43 years old. So I started wrestling when I was 18, but I only wrestled for six months and I blew my ACL. So, like, I never went back to school after that. And then I started touring in the band for the last 23 years. So, like, it was going to music head on because wrestling obviously didn't work out. I tried it. My knee said no. And I pieced out. And then right around 36, I started, like, there was a school that had opened in Buffalo. And I started training again then. And I didn't even want to, like, wrestle. I just wanted to bump around for, like, Jesse really that was it make him better so 
we were talking to MJF uh, earlier in the week, and you, and there was another young guy we were talking to, but it seems like there's this weird shift in the pro wrestling world where, I guess even before PD's time, where if you didn't have 15 years in the industry, you were not getting seen on TV at all. Now we're in this weird time where there are guys with two, three, four years that are in prominent roles in some of these companies, and I guess this might be for PD and you, but how did this shift to come about? When did it come about? I, I really think, I mean, PD, I, I, I don't want to step on you, but I think it's the internet. People see things so fast, man. You don't have to make a videotape anymore and send it into a place. Like people see that reaction now, like literally, like if a Canadian destroyer happened and people saw it right when it happened, when you first came up with it, like it would have been on ESPN. Like it's a CGI move. Like it looks CGI. <laughs> like, and that would have broke the internet. But at that time, you had to make a videotape and then like put your best of and then send it and hope that someone just saw it. And now some like little intern is going to go and he's going to see some crazy gif, go to his boss and be like, look at this crazy shit that happened. Blake Christensen literally grabbed onto the wall and latched onto the wall and then like jumped off of it like Spider-Man. And like, you saw that right when it happened. And it's like, I, the internet is like one of those things where maybe we're not getting some of these guys and me included, there's times where I have brain farts. Cause right now it's only been seven, six years. Like, and I've toured a band. So like you can condense that time down in the beginning there. <laughs> Cause I was touring full time. Um, I think it's, I think that it's, it's a, it's a time right now where the, the cream will rise to the top because if you're only wrestling for gifts and you're not really wrestling for the story, like you're going to get exposed pretty quick. You know what I mean? And like me, I, I did, I'm old, I'm 43 years old. So like, I didn't have the time to fail, <laughs> you know, only 43. That's cute. <laughs> no, it, that's the thing when you look when you look at your character and the first time anybody sees you on tv you initially think right away like this guy's probably been wrestling for 25 years he's probably like done yeah. everything it's you know headline madison square Garden. like you name it like all the territories that's what you would think yeah immediately not even close. <laughs> no and but you 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 grew up well not grew up i shouldn't say that you're you started in the business at the same time as this like you know, gift happening where, yeah. uh, you, you know what I mean? So, and like Dennis said, it's, it's, it's different. Like the, like you said, we had to send a tape and all that kind yeah, of dude, stuff. Like, crazy. We, we, and that's the thing. I think a lot of the times, um, you know, not, not kids nowadays, but up and coming wrestlers, they're, they're not paying their dues because you, everybody has a video camera. I'm talking into a video camera right now yeah. and they could film whatever. And then they get themselves over. I mean, it's just changed so Crazy. much and you're absolutely right uh if you're just wrestling to do that next cool move by the time people see a full match here you're like eh, you know whatever so yeah absolutely i mean you hit the nail on the head on that one uh yeah since i'm here and i we talked about the question so big merger uh you know aw impact new japan i just want to bring it up before dennis brings it up uh yeah <laughs> how how do you and blade feel about coming on over to impact, you know, you have strong uh, tag team division in AEW, strong uh, tag team division in impact. What are your thoughts on that? Dude? I, I like, I have a couple dream matches and one of my dream matches is the North. So if I could wrestle Josh Alexander and Ethan uh, page, I would, I would love to wrestle them. Um, in new Japan, like there's dudes that like, I want to wrestle in new Japan. I'm like a huge Hiroki Goto fan. I think he's one of the best wrestlers on the mm -hmm. earth. And, mm -hmm. uh, if I ever entered a ring with him, I'd probably start crying. So <laughs> you're killing your character right now, bro. I know, man. I know. I'm the worst. I bet I gotta stop doing interviews, man. <laughs> Dude, let, let, and you brought up your knee. Is is that something that's always in the back of your mind when you're in the ring now? Is that you know when's it gonna go? Is it gonna go? Is it healthy? Um, you, you kind of have to like. On something like that, like I'm, it's healthy. You know what I mean? My knees are, are healthy, but I am like aged for this business. You know what I mean? Like 
and even though I tour in a band, like I toured in a band before I was wrestling, um, like you're still sleeping in a van. You're not like, you know what I mean? Like I'm not, I'm not in a bus every single tour. And like, you know, I, I still like run out, run around on stage and like stage dive and, and stupid shit like that. So like my body is probably more messed up from that than wrestling. And like, I think when you have little injuries, you kind of learn how to like wrestle around them. It, it's funny because I had asked Lars, you know, ha, have you ever seen the butcher wrestle? He's like, yeah, I've seen him a few times. And then I asked you if you've ever had interactions with the, Lars and you said, yeah, you know, a, a few times. And I, I just want to know, Butcher, can you can you tell me a little bit about your time meeting Lars? Yeah, there was Lars. We had because um, we're I, we're both on Epitaph. Right. And there was a weird meeting like we were just getting signed and you, we were there and there was catering and you and I and Tim like we're getting catering at the same time. And I have this crazy Tim Armstrong story that happened to me when I used to tour at this band called Buried Alive. Mm. And um, it was in it was in Brooklyn and him and Roger Murray. Now, mind you, dude, I was like 17, 18 years old. Like, there's no way Tim would know who I was. No, like, no way. You never know, because my man's got a memory like an elephant. So I would not I would not say that because I've, I've literally seen him not see somebody for 35 years. And then they yeah. come up to him and he goes, yeah, I remember you. And we'll tell you dates, times and places. So just sorry to cut you off. This, this is, it was weird. Cause like I said, I was, I've never been anywhere at this point in time. Like literally just a dude, kid from Buffalo. And I started touring at this band Buried Alive. And like, at that time I used to document every single show I would go to. And like, I think I only saw Rancid one time and I was in the crowd. You know what I mean? Like at this point in time and him and Roger Murray came up to me. I had just loaded the band in the van. And I'm just sitting out there, like, just resting. And I had a bald head at the time, bald head, bald face. And Tim and Roger Murray came up to me and started talking to me. Like, they had known me for 20 years. And I had not lived for 20 years at that point in time. <laughs> like, oh, man, we got a tour again. Blah, blah. And I was like, I'm like, I just kind of went with it. I was like, yeah, man, we should we should totally do that. That would be rad. And, like, all the dudes in Baird Alive were, like, past them. And they're all sitting there looking at me like, what are you doing? Like, what is happening right now? Like, why are you talking to them? And, he, oh, yeah, anyways, so we were at Epitaph, and I told Tim that story, and he totally did not like it. Like, he was not feeling it. He, he literally, like, looked at me and goes, I don't think that was me. And I was like, all right, man. And you, like, came over, and you were like, how are you doing, man? You were, like, super nice after and it was really awkward. And then it was just maybe he was having a bad day or something like that. But it was really funny. Like, I told this story and he just kind of went, eh, I don't think that was me. And I was like, it was definitely you, man. Like, I, I know for a fact it was you. Anyways, yeah, that was the story. And that was like one of the times. And then I think we were like, maybe like Rock AM Ring, Rock AM Park, like one of those tours in Europe or something like that. I think we were like, we were really close to each other in, uh, on dressing rooms in the back. Like some two were like that. This is a while ago. It's sort of in like 2008, 9, 10, yeah. right around there. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, but it was like, and at that time, there was no conversation. I remember there was like Blood for Blood maybe would have been on the show, something like that. I was like hanging with them. And if you know any of those guys, it would have been them or Hatebreed or something like that. You like came up and started talking to a group of us. But it was rad. Anyways, yeah. Huge Rancid fan, so it was really cool. I'm a huge fan of what you do, and that kind of sort of leads me into one of my questions is because, you know, I mean, most of the world probably does know you from the band stuff. So when, so for me, at a young age, like finding rock and roll, punk rock, whatever, and then finding wrestling kind of happened. I mean, the rock and roll, I found that, you know, a couple years before punk rock. Yeah. Then wrestling kind of happened and I found that and I was like, oh shit. And so then the, the two worlds kind of collided in my world. When was that moment for you? What happened first? It was, well, my parents were very, very into music. Like they weren't musicians, but like there was always music out at the house. And, um, and I was fortunate, like they had everything from like Led Zeppelin to like Bad Brains. I would like, it was, I got like the full, you know, like every kind of music you could possibly think of for my parents. Um, so it was a little bit before, but like, I, 
I mean, wrestling, I feel like there's, there hasn't been a point in time in my life. I didn't like wrestling. So like, probably like, like you said, probably right around the same time. Like if you see like someone like Jimmy page, he looks like a wrestler. He's wearing like a dragon onesie. And like, that's why then I when you see it, what was that? That's why I loved kiss. Ex- exactly. But that was like, it was pro wrestling. It's, it's crazy that you say that. Cause right now I just discovered RuPaul's drag race. <laughs> and I'm realizing that like, that's just pro wrestling again and like a rock and roll. Like it's just a bunch of like, hu- you know, huge imaginations that create these like looks. And like, I think that was kind of like the fortunate thing for me, like music wise is like finding that outlet, like really quick and realizing like, oh, okay, I think this is me. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I like that you know and then I remember like when wrestling started and I started like paying attention to the smoke and mirrors of wrestling and I was like "Ooh, this is like again this is kind of like when you know you hear like a solo in a song and you're like oh man like when that like when you know it's Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Bret Hart and Iron Man match and like he's bleeding out of his face like that's that's like the outro of Days and Confused. You know what I mean? Like that's, and if people can only see like in the music world, like you, you have friends that like don't take wrestling serious in the music scene. They think you're crazy for it. Right. And you're like, I, I, don't, I don't understand why I have to defend myself to you about <laughs> this thing because you're singing about being a badass in a mic and you've never been in a, fat, a fight in your life. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, and you meet guys like that, and you're like, how do you not like wrestling? Like, you are wrestling. No. Well, that's, yeah. a, you know, I mean, because it's for me, it's the connection's easy because I feel like in order as a performer playing music, and I've, and I've done one professional wrestling match as a promoter and as a manager. Yeah. So I, I have, like, I've done that before, but I never, like, obviously been in the ring and, and tangled, t- uh, tangled up with anybody. Of course, I'm not that stupid, but um my point is is that like for me to get ready for a show it's like and as i'm sure you can relate to there's this mindset that you kind of get into which is is like you know it's it's kind of like you times 10. Yeah. Um, so the the sort of the warm-up for you wrestling a match as opposed to playing a show is there any differences or is it the same kind of like sort of mental um uh wind up a little bit it, it's I think I'm thinking too much now. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm still in that, I'm still in the thinking mode of like wrestling where like, I'm, I'm trying to remember like 20 things that like, I'm not supposed to remember, but I have to remember at all times. Do you know what I mean? That like second nature stuff where like with guitar playing, it's like, there's only so many ways you can play one of the songs that are already written. You're not like going out there and improv like every night where like, Imagine if we were in a band right now, we all played different instruments and for 15 minutes before we were about to go out and play, we like wrote songs. It's insane. Do you know what I mean? So like the preparation's a little different because like you have a back catalog that you can go to where like you kind of don't. Like I have no idea what I'm going to do in a match until I'm sitting there calling it with people and then the vibe starts and like you get it going. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about about that type of stuff but like it's a lot like writing a song and it's 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 just it's beautiful to go out there and understand that you're basically playing music but you're doing it physically and you're conveying a story just like you would in a song but you're doing it physically and showing them I don't know it like to me it's like a beautiful it's poetry for me like both of them obviously but I don't know I'm glad you said that because I thought I had a stretch question because, you know, you do a ton of these interviews and sometimes people try to try to make these parallels that aren't really there and they try to put them together. And my one kind of parallel question was, is like putting a set list together for a concert the same as putting a match together for yourself? I, I want to answer that as well. Please. please. Butch. No, Butcher, you please. I, I, I honestly think that's true because there's different. Lars, I don't know if this is how you like different cities. There's just different vibes. Mm -hmm. And you realize that if you play Chicago and you're at the subterranean or you're at the Metro or something like that, and there's no security, 
Like you really can't play the slow ones. You gotta just beat the shit out of them. You know what I mean? And then there's there's just different times and places. Like New York City is always gonna be a bigger show, and like you're gonna have like a different vibe for New York City than you are for Lawrence, Kansas. But Lawrence, Kansas is always awesome. It's just a different context. So like the set list has to kind of change because Lawrence, Kansas is like a college town of maniacs and New York City is like, usually there's maniacs, but there's also people out for like a Friday night. You know what I mean? So like the it's set list is a little different. It's a maniac city full, full of college kids now. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, because I mean, that's the thing when I, because I'm the set list guy and I have been since I think about like the eighth show of the band. Yeah. And, but the thing, and my band always makes fun of me about it to the point where Brandon has called me a professional tr a wrestler trapped into a punk rocker's body. But so I see, I see like, the the set list is like is like a is like a match it's like you you got to come out and you got to fight and then you got to slow it down and get some headlocks in there take it to the ground yes get the people because there's a psychology right so you got to you got to hook them and i always felt like in the like the, some of my favorite matches it's in that slow down period you know in the headlocks and the groundwork and the stuff like that that's where you could really kind of grab into an audience and then yeah. you got to come out with your big finish and you got to go home and you know, I'm going home with Ruby Soho and time of course. because that's just the way it's, that's just the way it was written for me. But, and like you said, you kind of have to look at different cities. So this is kind of an interesting thing because like you said, you got to kind of call audibles in uh, a, uh, on a, in a set according to the city. Since you're going to one place all the time now to wrestle, and it's not like you're going out to different cities, do you feel like um, it's different in the sense that, you know, you, obviously you don't want to do the same set. And like you said, you're kind of doing, you know, different things every night with different guys or whatever it is. But do you find it now that you're just going into that one place that you're getting more comfortable? Or does it still feel like, um, I have to, uh, like, do you still get that spark of creativity? Um, I, I mean, I, I'm still getting the spark of creativity regardless. So you know what I mean? Like, it's just the way my brain works. Um, I'm like trying to think 300 steps ahead um, at every moment. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just, yeah. I'm, and there's like three different kinds of wrestlers in this, like tomorrow, this like six man that I'm in. There's three different kinds of wrestlers with Lance, Ray, and Mox. So then you have to kind of like break each guy down and be like, okay, what cool shit can I do with this guy? And I'm still not, that's still like my favorite part of, of wrestling is like the creative part of it. Coming to like Jacksonville every week, it's tough, but I also like, I think it's a learning experience to wrestle for the people at home. And it's only going to make me a better wrestler, better wrestler on TV to do that now because I have to only pay attention to the TV instead of a live crowd where I might miss something and like look at the crowd and like pay attention to the crowd. Now I get to pay attention to that. And then when the crowd comes back, it's going to be so explosive, man. Like the energy is going to be so crazy. The energy is going to be crazy. Every single person on this roster that wrestles that night is going to cry in the ring. I guarantee it. You know, once again, said something great. I want to piggyback and turn it into a question of we're living in an age now where no matter what company company you look at, they have right now the greatest roster in wrestling history, no matter where you look. Even AEW right now, from top to bottom, has probably one of the greatest rosters in history. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it is. And then you essentially being a rookie, and I'm doing the finger thing for the yeah. podcast people at home, do you find yourself still in awe? Do you pick people's brain out? Because there's a certain line of at that level where you have to – you can't really mark out and you have to kind of act a role of a professional wrestler. But at the same time, you may want to go up to one of the more established veterans and pick their brain, but it's still kind of weird yeah no like this roster is so family oriented that like 
I, I mean, at first I was definitely freaked out. I remember when we made our debut, the first person I saw coming back was Billy uh, Gunn. And he came up to me and just towered over me. And I thought he was going to like cut my head off. And all he told me was to make my finish a little more intense. And I, he was super happy, like when he said it. And I, I, it like blew my mind. You know what I mean? And like one of my all-time favorite wrestlers is Dean Malenko. And I talked to that guy three days every single other week. You know what I mean? It's, it's insane. And I pick his brain. Um, he shows me stuff. I have Arn Anderson coming up to me after matches and telling me stuff. I have Jerry Lynn telling me stuff. Like the, the most insane thing is that any person that's part of this thing that has that much resource and doesn't use it is an idiot, like an absolute idiot, regardless if you've wrestled for seven years or if you've wrestled for 70 years, like you're getting real time critiques from guys who have done this for countless years i think we did some crazy like um oh, i can't think of it like uh the kevin baking game like like third or three degrees of uh, and we can like this roster goes back to carl gotch or something like that or like hackenschmidt or something like that like like someone wrestled like billy robinson or something like that and like you can go back the lineage from the people that are part of AEW roster it it goes back in like to the 1800s it's it's insane that's nuts. i know carl gotch wasn't that time but yeah <laughs> that that is so phenomenal i i tell you what lars i'm sitting here geeking out talking to this guy this is a this is this might be my favorite interview since i got <laughs> to talk on this one no i'm stoked because you know just watching you and watching you grow and seeing you in other promotions and sort of knowing you from the band stuff yeah and, being curious from that as well and then watching how you kind of do your thing it's, it's been it's been really cool to watch and it's and one of the things i also wanted to ask you which you kind of answered and um is because you have this wealth of knowledge behind there and i feel like we've you know i don't want to like out anybody but um i've, I've asked the question before you know do you ever go back and, and sort of seek out you know like hey did i do this or whatever it is you know um if there was one guy besides Dean Malenko that you could with that, like, like that has given you the best advice and you said, Billy Gunn told you about the finish. Has there been anybody else that's been pivotal back there for you? Um, Christopher Daniels. Christopher Daniels is the, he's been one of my favorite wrestlers for as long as I can remember. And um, he really cares about us. So like he'll definitely, and he speaks my language. So like, he told me a while ago, like he put something in there. He's like, right now you're giving me all commas. I need periods and exclamation points. And I was like, wow, I wish someone had said that to me. You know what I mean? Like that's an easy way to put, like if you were wrote a song and you had all commas in a song, it would just be a runoff song that like no one would remember, but you got to put some periods and some exclamation points in it. And then, you know, you have a song, you know, a great song. What, Curry, Curry Man, I, I love Curry Man and that whole thing. And I used oh, to see Chris the man. Time on, the, on the indies, you know, over here. And um, he's obviously got a wealth of knowledge. He's where, incredible, man. Where do you see, you know, and I say this every fucking time we do a podcast, but like, I really feel that, you know, we are at this new dawn of professional wrestling. And like you said, it's like, and Dennis was pointing out, like, there's a lot of these young guys and this new blood that maybe haven't been in the business for 15 years before they get on TV. Where, where do you, what, what are your feelings about the cross promotional st stuff that's happening with impact now, new Japan and AEW? Do you think this is going to be good for the business or do you think it's going to, you know, it's just become some overwhelming clusterfuck at some point? Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping for the best cause I'm a part of it. So like, Obviously, I want this to be the coolest thing. Um, I don't know if they have ideas for us in, in any of the cross promotions. So I'm like, I'm really happy doing what I'm doing right now. Obviously, like I see things like the North and stuff like that out of the corner of my eye. And I know that we're going to do, if we end up in the ring with them, we're going to end up doing like great things. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. I hope not. You know what I mean? Because that's like kind of wrestling's kind of storied past is like 
people get involved, too many people get involved, too many cooks in the kitchen. Obviously, egos are going to get played involved and, um, you know, it falls apart. But I think like I do to just to like put it on a smaller scale, like, you know, there's a merger that had happened with these three companies on the on TV in on the Indies right now. The Indies are like a legit like third big promotion. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that like there are a ton of tiny promotions obviously they don't have the TV that, you know, we have, or some of the other ones have, but right now there's so many ways to watch wrestling that just the independence alone, you can make a, you can make a living right now, just being an independent wrestler because there's so many outlets for it. I mean, not currently in, in COVID land, but like in general, there's so many avenues right now. Go ahead, sir. I got it. I got to take this back to the very beginning of the podcast when you were talking about your voice and we all had a good, <laughs> but it, it, it made me ask this question, I guess, is does that affect how you portray yourself in the ring with holding a mic, uh, maybe even cutting a promo? Are you self-conscious about your look vo- vo- versus your voice? Oh, uh... No, I think because I think when I when I do interviews, I want people to know the real me. I, and I know that like it might not be what they perceive, but like the the truth is like I'm I'm not trying to eat people, and you know what I mean. Like, oh man, and, all right, it's over. we're done. But I I mean I I want to be able to like I want people to actually hear what I'm saying and understand that like there's an art form that that is being done and. I want, because I come from music, I want the people that like music to like look at this art form and say like, wow, man, that that story that they were telling, the, this story of like Eddie, uh, Eddie Kingston and his family just for some reason was on TV for 18 weeks. For four months, we were on TV straight. And there was a story that we were telling. And every single week we got that story out there. And I think that that's, I want that to be seen and these interviews, I want them to see the real me because the person that wrestles in the ring is not, is not me. It's a completely different person. You know what I mean? Like I have to get there. Like you said earlier about like the head frame, like I have to get in there and, and I have to do the butcher. And on this, I can't really do that. I have to talk about, you know, I have to talk normal. And I, I think that that's weird and, and not kayfabe, but at the same time, like it is the truth. If if someone came out to me on the street, I wouldn't want the perception of me to be this like mean haggard guy. <laughs> I'd want them to walk away going like, oh man, I just like learned something or you know what I mean? Like something like that. Is there weird and, and by the way, Lars, I don't mean to like hijack this because I'm yeah. kind of speaking out too. But is there wiggle room in your character to evolve into something else? Or at 43, do you feel kind of locked into like, this is the butcher. This is what it's going to be until maybe the end of my wrestling career. Um, no, not at all. I think there's, there's a lot of room there. I mean, I've never done comedy wrestling, but <laughs> hopefully in like 10 years, I can do a bunch of comedy wrestling. Is, is that what you cut your teeth on? comedy wrestling yeah well i mean what was kind of what you grew up on wrestling wise yes um no never 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 comedy like i'm a huge all japan mark so like all japan is like my that's my like wrestling history um and then obviously like wcw nitro was like i would say like me as a person w wcw nitro has has had a lot to do with if it wasn't the Chrome eggs, it was probably that. <laughs> I WCW guy. I missed. I missed all the attitude error because I was, I was that one wrestling fan that I didn't get into the tape trading. I was locked into one product and I watched it growing up, and I didn't do the dirt sheets either, and I still don't do them because I love to be yeah. surprised. So whenever I hear someone bring up WCW, it kind of feels like we're kindred spirit, spirits, like yeah. you know. Because we're a dying breed of wrestling fans. If we were WCW guys, ah, uh, dude, it's I. I literally just watched the first Nitro the other day, 
And then I stopped watching at like the fifth nitro. <laughs> like I, it was on all day. My dogs got punished. My dogs just watched like old nitros like all day while I was like cleaning the house and like stuff like that. I just had it on in the back. And dude, I was like, I was taking notes, which I haven't done in a while. I was like watching and like taking notes. I just saw things that I normally wouldn't see. It was great, man. Like it, WCW is so awesome because you never knew what was going to happen. You never knew what the next match was. You, you know what I mean? Like it, it would be like, it would be like some Southern wrestler and like a luchador. And then I remember like seeing like Hooventude, Hooventude like come out and like wrestle like the gambler. And I'd be like, what is going to happen? <laughs> like, how do these guys know this? The, and then the match was awesome. You know what I mean? It was just, it was awesome. Like WCW Nitro was like, it was awesome. Well, I feel like that's what AW, AEW is kind of doing is they're kind of bringing back the guessing, you know, and as yes. a fan, you know, that's what I've always wanted. I want that suspension of disbelief, right? I want to yes. be surprised because, this, the, the, you know, having that emotional connection or finding an emotional connection to someone um, is the most important thing, right? That's what we're all trying to do, whether we're, we're musicians or we're pro wrestlers. Yes. Um, so like, and I, I wanted to talk, kind of talk about the Indies thing because before the COVID thing, I know the Indie in my neighborhood was getting 300 people, you know, yeah. in a little high school uh, gymnasium. And it was awesome. And you're getting to see guys, a lot of the guys that are actually in AEW right now. Yeah. Um, do you feel like there is a more, so comparing to what's happening up, up North, as you guys say, would you say it's a more of an independent kind of vibe in AEW? I, yes and no. I think that, I think that, I think Tony like handpicked the guys that did the indies, like obviously, right? I mean, you have Cole Cabana and you have like Chuck Taylor and you know what I mean? Like dudes like that, that were on the indies forever. And like, they can put, a TV match out there, or they could put on this, like a crazy, like spotty, like indie thing that will like, people will still like watching, you know what I mean? Um, I think it has like, there is definitely like an indie mind frame, but I, it's definitely like I'm wrestling for a big league. You know what I mean? It's not like, there's not like that. I mean, we get, we get dressed in the actual locker room. It's nice. <laughs> it's not like a kitchen you know what i mean it's it's nice yeah i followed pete around a, a ton of indie shows and i actually met pepper a few times out and i want to say it was maybe a show out around buffalo or toronto and they were you're right getting changed in a kitchen and yeah around the corner the girls were getting changed and it just kind of blew my mind but that's what you guys do well that's like yeah. punk shows man it's like exactly you uh, that's kind of what it is and then you know so there's obviously you've done that and then now you're in these dressing rooms um i guess i guess it's the attitude that that, that i feel like aew has it has that independent spirit is what i, sh what Dude, I should call it. it literally is and it, like i know that like it's cliche for someone to say like oh man that guy's punk rock tony khan is like he doesn't understand it but he is punk rock a lot of what he does is just because he wants to see it done right. and it hasn't been done before. And I think that just the balls that you have to have to do that is insane. And that's like, dude, do you remember going on your first tour ever where you were like leaving home and going across the country with like, not the right amount of money. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. but like, and now, like, looking back on that, there's days where, like, oh, man, I would die to be broke right now. You know what I mean? Like, the, that type of thing, because you're I so no. <laughs> But you're so hungry. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying, like, in music. Because you're just, like, you're so hungry at that time. And, like, everything is just flowing. Like, music is just, you're, you're constantly humming a tune. And, like, you're broke and, like, trying to make it happen. And you're making it happen. And then it's so rewarding when it actually does pay off. And I think that like in wrestling, a lot of these guys have that exact same feeling where like for years 
they were told they had what it took and then they got to that point and then it got all taken away from them. And then, you know what I mean? Like, and now we're all here in AEW and no one wants to step on each other. They, everybody wants to build each other up. And I feel like that's kind of like in punk rock, there's never like, there's no like point system. It's like, no one's a better band than each other's band. You're just, you're, you have to realize that you're playing the show for the people. And like, if you're there and you've kind of like struggled when it gets easy, it's not about you anymore. It's just about them. You just, you make them like the fans enjoy the show more and more. And I think that like, I think Tony understands that a lot of these guys have sacrificed and now, Hey, I'm going to give you the universe. You do you, and I'm going to get it out there. And I think that that's the balls that that dude has to do or it has to have like to do that right now is insane. He has, he is like the most motherfucker of all motherfuckers. Once again, you are driving this interview and I'm sitting here listening to you and you're <laughs> asking a lot of my questions and you, you talk about Tony, you talk about the environment and the AEW. And I know once again, Petey, who was in the band with the Motor C machine guns once, once pitched yeah. them back like, Hey, can we do our own theme song? And they shot it down. And you're in a company where Tony Khan is going out and buying all these major songs for some of these wrestlers that that fits these guys. Have you, being a musician, thought about or tried to pitch writing you guys' entrance song or recording something? Um, yeah, I was going to try to do it with ours, but we, we literally only had six days to, to come up with something. So, like, I couldn't get into a studio and like do something in six days. So like Mikey Ruckus, the guy that writes all the stuff for AEW, like he had something in mind. Um, we kind of gave him our like indie music, which was this band called Twitching Tongues. Yeah. Um, and kind of mimicked what they did a little bit to it. You know, it was very like stompy, two big dudes just going to a ring instead of, I really thought about it. And like Mikey had it like tuned up and I had him tune it down and then slow it down. And then it's now the music's like awesome. When I hear it, I'm like pumped about it. So I always wanted to write my own like entrance, but at the same time, it's like, it's one less thing I have to worry about, which will be rad. <laughs> it's kind of rad, but at some point in time, I would like to, I, I maybe, maybe by the end of the year, I'll, I'll have something. All right. So how many times do you hear somebody's music and you just judge the fuck out of it? Come on. Oh, be all the time. All the time. <laughs> Dude, I'll tell you what, right? But then uh, there's other times where like, like Thunder Rosa's music is insane. It's like Sepultura. It sounds like a Sepultura song. It's so cool. When I heard it, I was like, this is I, first, my first, I mean, it's, it's kind of not even close, but Brujeria, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, just, it's got this, whoa, you know? Yeah. Technology. But you're right. Sepultura is actually way, way more closer than my thoughts, but. Every time I hear it, like if I'm, if I'm in the crowd, like when her music hits, I get so pumped. I get so fired up. It's great. It's a great song. <laughs> you're you're doing a lot of traveling. Do you listen to podcasts? Are you strictly music? What kind of podcasts do you listen to? It all depends, man. Like I, I just got off a really, I mean, I'm still in it, but I just got off a like four month banger of being into, like I'm just listening to Zappa constantly. Love Zappa. Um, yeah. Real weird. Uh, like four months ago, I started listening to like, I've always listened to Zappa, but like, I've just been listening to Zappa lately. Um, and then podcast wise, like I always, I like, like, I like conspiracy and stuff like that. So like, I'll listen to, there's one called, um, um, conspiracy files or something like that. And they'll do things like Montauk and, and like ghost stories and stuff like that. Does that have the yellow cover on the podcast? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, yeah. I love that one. Yeah, me too. The I think are those the podcast guys? I think so. I think so. I I, I got into like I I think everyone kind of goes through like the the whole like murder podcast phase. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did that for a while, and I started realizing that I was like I just was never in a good mood, so I had to get out of the murder <laughs> podcast. And then like when you're in the conspiracy world, a lot of times things sound like comic books, so it's kind of cool to hear people like actually think things are like real 
So I kind of get in that. Like every once in a while, I'll throw a flat earth podcast on just to entertain myself. And it's pretty fun. I think- I'm sorry if either of you guys are flat earthers. No, 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 like no. That- <laughs> to, me, to me, it's like a punk rock has taught me one thing and that was to stay open-minded at all as possible. You know Absolutely. I mean? And I, I, so I, I don't really, I mean, we made a whole record in 1998 called Life Will Wait, talking about the Masons and the Illuminati for Christ. Yeah. Sake, you know, which people are now just talking about, even Karen's from Marin. You yeah. Know, you know, believe in it. So, I, I mean, so I'm not, a, you know, I, I kind of have a little issue that all these like yuppies are co-opting my issues, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess that was the whole point in the first place. But to bring it back yeah. to, to the wrestling thing, you know, um, so how, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask, I've been meaning to ask somebody, how long are you guys actually there filming for a show? Um, it all depends. Like, so we do, um, like Dynamite's always the same time, like eight to, uh, to 10. Um, and then we film like darks around it. So like sometimes we'll film a couple darks before and sometimes we'll film a couple after. Gotcha. So we're there like, yeah. And it's, it's, um, yeah, so we're there every week. Do you guys, st- you know, have meet and greets with the fans still, or is that all done? No. I know they had kind of letting in a limited section of fans, but I didn't know if there was any interaction between the wrestlers and the fans. No, we can't go anywhere near them. So that's like they do like amazing, uh, you know, health protocol. Right. So like we're not we're not mingling at all with uh, with anyone outside. It's good and sad at the same time. And I, I'm sure you guys would love to just be out there signing autographs and taking pictures and kissing babies. Oh, man. I'm, I like miss people like big time. I'm a people person. So um, I love I love meeting fans and like, you know, chilling by the merch and just talking to people. Um, I miss it for well, sure. Last question. Well, because well, I mean, I'm a tag team guy, right? So I, yeah. I, Tag team wrestling was always my favorite. My, some of my, all my favorite wrestlers, whether it be the Rock and Roll Express or Road Warriors or, or whatever it is, like they've always been tag teams. You're part of it, you know, I think one of the best tag teams. Thank do you. you do, of course. Do you, do you <laughs> like that style? Do you like working with another guy? I mean, you know, the singles thing is obviously a different headspace. What is Way your, different. Yeah. So what do you prefer the most? I love tag team wrestling, man. I love the fact that I can go out there with my best friend and I can actually show people that he's my best friend. And like, we can make it look like we have one mind because that's kind of what tag team wrestling is. You know what I mean? So it's kind of weird. You kind of get those weird disconnects when it's just like guys who team up together because they don't really have the double team moves where like me and Jess now think, Like, I'm never thinking about, like, a move I can do. I'm always thinking a move we can do. You know what I mean? Like, it's never, it's never me. You know what I mean? And I really like that. I like the fact that uh, it's me and my best friend. Have you, has it ever crossed your mind to go to Tully and Arn and corner those two dudes at the same time and pick them up? That was like one of the, thir- there's, we have a guy named Alex Marvez here who does like um, some commentating um, backstage or whatever. And we were talking and I was like, oh man, I want to, I want to talk to Arn like really bad. This is like early on. This is like, we still had crowds and this is early on went for us being an AW. And um, I was so nervous, man. I, I was like, oh man, you know, he's going to yell at me or something or like blah, blah. blah. And I, Alex goes, well, do you want to talk to him? I'll take you to him right now. And I was like, no, I'm not ready yet. Like, I have to, like, I, I can't talk to one of my heroes just, on the, just out of nowhere. Like, I have to, like, I have to build up to this, you know? And then, like, 15 minutes later, he just walked up to me. He goes, Arn's sitting in this room. He's waiting for you right now. Don't make Arn Anderson wait. And I was like, all right. And I, like, walked in this room. And, like, dude, it, because these dudes still have it, man. Like, they're not physically they can't get in there and they can't do it but their minds are still there man and they're still thinking wrestling and they still see every in and out um and arm was like taking his phone and making his phone like a tiny little wrestling ring and he was like going over strategy of things i could do to make myself look bigger and make myself look stronger while still make like still making a guy look great but still keeping myself strong and that was like a big thing I was kind of um, I was kind of struggling with when I first came here because on the Indies, 
I was always kind of a baby face. I never was like a heel. We were like the road warriors on the Indies. Then you come here and then it's like, whoa, you're healing. And now you're healing on TV. So like now it's a crash course in like, where's cameras? Where's everything like that? Um, And if I didn't have Arn and I didn't have Dean and stuff like that, like this would be so hard, man. Jerry, to be honest with you, Jerry Lynn is like, Jerry Lynn texts me like, randomly during the week and he'll tell me like what matches to watch i'll be like oh check this match out from from this and then um you know he'll give me like homework and stuff like that they really do care about us it's awesome and like i said the arn was terrifying because like I, there was a point in time where i just tried to dress like arn anderson <laughs> like i had like like the glasses you know, that did went you have the red solo cup to add to it not the red solo cup, but I did do like the half glasses, like the glasses that went from like dark to clear. I shaved my head, had like a beard. I would wear like half shirts because like, you know the picture of him and Rick leaning up against the Cadillac. Like I don't have the balls to ask him if he still has that outfit and I can have it. But <laughs> at some point in time, I'm going to go, hey, man, I need those yellow shorts. I need that red top and that hat. So he's the man. So we're we're gonna wrap this up, and this is your first okay. time. Hopefully, not your last time. We definitely not the last. Thank God, because we I have <laughs> a million more questions, and we're still gonna talk off the air because, like I say all the time, for you guys at home, the show's over. For us, we're gonna hit stop, and we're still gonna geek out over each other. <laughs> uh, Andy, where can people find you? At Andy complains on everything. Okay. And it's not like, again, like I just kept my same handle. I didn't change it to the butcher. I think if you type in butcher of Buffalo too, and it'll come up on, on Twitter for Twitter, but at Andy complains on everything. And uh, Lars, we do want to take a second. The thing about it is, is this is, I think this needs to be a two or three parter because I think we scratched the surface. It's like one of those things. It's, you know, there's so much I wanted to ask you and I'm just going to have to fucking save it. Plus, more and more is going to happen with you guys. So yeah, I'll just, I just, you know, I just want to thank you for coming on and making, taking the time. Yeah. I'll always do this. I'm, Tuesdays are usually my best night. So if you guys yeah. ever want to do it Tuesdays, I'm here. Don't say always. That's how Lars became a co-host. He's like, <laughs> what? I got I'm fucking here. swamped in this motherfucker, but thank God I did because you know, I, I wish Dimitri and a few, I, hopefully next time we'll get, have most of the other guys with us too, because yeah, you know, I think you would really have a lot, a lot of fun with Mac and Dimitri and, 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 you know, maybe get Petey for a full, you know, however long. Cause I, cause it's, it's a good energy, but I'm, I'm also thing, very stoked that it was just as intimate as it yeah. was. Yes. That does, that's the crazy thing, man. If you guys like think about what you guys are doing for professional wrestling, if this catches fire, it's insane because you're drawing people from so many different places and like, I think that that's the re- that's the beauty of wrestling right now is there's so many different outlets and one of the outlets is that there's now a podcast with five people that do five different things but bringing wrestling to the center and I think that that's really cool. Cool. Oh, man, we're going to have to convert you to a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. I like I listen to Rocky, I listen to Rocky Romero uh what you think podcast, of that? the last one. I love dude Rocky's like he literally is like and I mind you, I've just recently met him. I've always just had this little like he's such a cutie. Like yeah. he is such a cutie. Like I, I love him. I love his wrestling. Um, he's such a rad dude. Like every podcast I've ever listened to him, he sounds real. And then when I met him, he's just a real dude, you know? And he like he um we have a uh, Brody King is like uh one of my best friends, and Brody King like thinks Rocky is like one of the greatest people of all time. So I was like, if, if Brody thinks he's one of the greatest, he's gotta be the greatest. So. So here's what people don't understand about the Rocky interview. And I've had to explain it to a few people. Rocky gave us so much information that he didn't have to give us and that he's never given any other show and wrestlers know what podcasts they want to talk to and they have to do. And Rocky opening up and giving us that kind of stuff was a gift from him to us. That was amazing. Yeah, that you don't get from anywhere else. And that right there is a perfect compliment. So people think that, oh, these guys just come on and answer questions. It's not true. Wrestlers come onto a podcast very guarded. And 
and not always willing to give up a ton of information. And I think podcast fans don't quite understand that. Yeah. I, I think another thing too, is like, you're also seeing like, all you guys are passionate. All you guys are passionate about your stuff and like wrestlers are passionate about their stuff. And it's, it's one of those things to go, like, we all have that to talk about. Mm -hmm. So like, we're not, technically i'm just sitting here talking about myself but really we're talking about wrestling mm -hmm. and like that's really cool i think that that's like the coolest thing and like everyone's a baseball fan or if not they're a music fan if not they're you know like pd williams is on this fucking show like pd williams is like one of the best like x division champions of all time you know what i mean like it's insane yeah so listen, guys at home, first of all, <laughs> thank you to all of our newest subscribers and everybody who's listened. Uh, the comments keep pouring them in. We really love them. Lars, uh, we we haven't thanked the fans enough recently, but we got to say thank you guys for coming along this journey. Thanks for tuning in and just, you know, supporting what we're doing here. I mean, I, I just, like you said, Butcher, it's like, you know, we're passionate about, you know, our, obviously what we do, but we all share this commonality with this passion for, and the love for pro wrestling, you know what I mean? And just being involved. And it's so super cool to me to be able to talk to somebody that does this because yeah. like, I've always just admired it. And I just, I do, I'm five eleven. you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I, I can't be a rep. I'll be maybe a super junior. I don't know, but I, and, but just like, I, I also, I don't want to get my ass beat. I've had, had that <laughs> enough 20 years ago. So yeah. But, um, you know, just the, the admiration that I have for you guys, you know, and just watching you perform and entertain me because this wrestling was my escape. So, yeah. and, so and, and I just appreciate, you know, everybody listening to us and commenting and, and all these things. It's super cool. And it's rad that we get guys like you coming on and just having some fun because that's what of this course, is all about, right? Yes. And this was fun. It was so fun. All right, guys, uh, the show's over for you guys. We're going to geek out over each other for a minute. So <laughs> Wrestling Perspective on all major podcast platforms, make sure you subscribe. We got that new YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe, leave a comment, blah, blah, blah. Good night. See you guys later.